welcome to all of you who have taken the time out to be with us today. This is our first of the leadership seminar series and uh, I'll give you a brief introduction about myself and of course our guest tonight and the purpose behind this entire uh, seminar series. So um, my name is uh, Jaya Payeri Jayashri and uh, also the uh, principal investigator for the research that we are doing on women and leadership in collaboration with Dubai Business Women's Council. And my co-investigator is here with me, uh, Professor Valerie Lindsay. Both of us, we started off this research about an year ago. We felt that there was enormous opportunity within the region to understand the complexities of how women navigate this multi-layered space uh, when they enter into a career and as they progress towards their leadership. Some research has been done within the region which is significant, but at the same time there are tremendous opportunities to find more. And uh, well, we approached Dr. Rajal Gur from Dubai Business Women's Council and you know, put our ideas in front of her and then we applied to the National Research Foundation grant because uh, again, this is one of the strategic priorities of UAE. A lot of investment has gone into tertiary education and uh, we got the grant. So that's how we started on this journey about a year ago. And since then, we have had the opportunity to meet a number of outstanding women who, have, who are in the process of contributing to the economic growth of the country. We thought, why not then bring it into the public space and you know make it more of a dialogue with the women who are working in the corporate sector as self-employed entrepreneurs uh, so that there could be more voices into this whole debate on women and leadership. So let me introduce to you our guest for tonight, Hazel Nyandoro. Welcome Hazel, okay. uh, who is the founder and managing director of Manalith Consulting a company offering strategic image development services to organizations and individuals. Based in the UAE, Manalith covers frontier markets in the Middle East, Africa and Europe. Hazel has worked on a range of projects under the Manalith banner. Between 2006 and 2015, Hazel has held several roles in the corporate and investment banking division of JP Morgan Chase, working in both London and Dubai. Her key roles included CFO for global pension funds, Investor Services Sub-Sahara and Vice President in Treasury Services and Trade Finance, uh, Financial Middle East, Africa and Turkey. Prior to join, joining JP Morgan, Hazel spent several years of her career working for the John Lewis Partnership as developing and implementing its organizational restructuring strategy. So, fantastic profile there. And aside from her blue chip management development and training programs, Hazel achieved a BSc Honours Economic and Social Policy from the University of London and has a postgraduate qualification in Personal Development from the University of Westminster. She enjoys networking and foreign travel. So, welcome to Hazel. Uh, so, Hazel, um, to begin our journey, uh, you might want to share with us something about your career journey. You have been head of corporate, uh, you know, in a, in a financial sector and then you decided to step back a little bit and, and become self-employed, an entrepreneurial career. So how has the, this transition been? What are some of the enablers of this transition or is there anything specific that you might like to share with the audience here? I'd like to start off by saying it's such an honor and a privilege to be here tonight. Um, I would find it really, um, a, it's a powerful experience for me to be able to share my journey with, with such beautiful and amazing women as you all are. My career in investment banking, retail as you mentioned, has been an experiment for me quite frankly. Uh, when I say that I've always found that risk, the absence of fear or just being able to navigate the space of fear when you're starting on a path in any choice of um, career, something that would be an enabler as you say it. So in my case specifically, it really was thinking about what I like, thinking about what I enjoy, thinking about where I could make an impact. And more often than not, it was in spaces where women aren't traditionally welcome. Note. <laughs> um, as a person who is motivated by challenge and motivated by, I guess, bucking the trend, I would say it was actually quite easy for me to identify where I wanted to be in that respect. 
at the point that you get in, you start navigating how you make an impact, whether you're going to be rejected or not is a real concern. Um, in some cases, that was, that was the case. Um, but then it's how, how quickly you turn that around. So my experience has been, okay, you don't like me for whatever reason. I don't typically go to because I'm a woman first, because I like to believe that leadership is a genderless concept. Is it because I'm black, which is a real factor when you work in the East, I mean, in the West, and in fact, when you work outside of Africa. But then again, stereotypes, which I fight against with every single ounce of my being, because I refuse to accept that we do not have a legitimate place in this world, given how much we contribute towards it. Okay. In short. <laughs> Fantastic. You use the word influence. What exactly do you mean by that? Now, would you say that uh, in your own path towards navigating your career, you said that you're constantly challenging the, the kind of barriers, the potential barriers that you might have faced uh, being uh, black and being a woman in the financial sector, which is largely male dominated. What about the, what, what are the um, individual factors that, uh, that helped you in fighting those external voices and, and, and also some of the voices in your own head? Because as we are growing up, uh, we are all listening to some messages from, you know, within the environment that a ma male can do this and a female should do this and somewhere along the line it also gets internalized within our, within our own self. So would you say that that played a role in your life as well or perhaps your socialization was such that the voices in your head were always very empowering? What would you say to that? I think to answer that, to give any justice to your question, I'll start off by giving you a bit of background about how I grew up. So I am a Zimbabwean, born in the UK, but spent very many years in, in Zimbabwe, which is in Southern Africa. I could take it even further and say, my mother tells me that from the time I was in her womb, I was dictating what she ate and when. <laughs> um, but coming out of that, really, I think, you know, be below the age of 12, my first responsibility was being made a school prefect in my primary school. At that point, you don't really notice gender. The extent of your responsibility is making sure that there's no litter in the playground and people are standing in line and going to class on time. So that was a very easy kind of introduction to responsibility outside the family, outside the home. Take it a step further at the age of 16. I'm then appointed as junior deputy mayor for the city of Harare, which is literally a mirror, a junior like a mirror of the city council. That was my first heartbreak around what leadership meant. Because the, a guy was made mayor who I felt I was much more qualified for the role than, but nobody had ever heard of a female junior mayor before. These are my peers nominating us. So I found that gravely disappointing. And that's when I guess that trigger went off in my mind. So actually, no, this is unjust. I do not like injustice, so how do I prevent this from ever happening again. The only limiting factor that I've discovered is me. I'm the only person who can prevent myself from breaking through glass ceilings. I'm the only person who can you know, prevent myself from achieving a vision for realizing dreams. And I think that's true for most women that I've interacted with, where there's this real fear for the unknown and this real reticence to dive in the deep end. Um, which is very different to my male counterparts. So do you mean the imposter syndrome? Do you feel, do you feel like an imposter? Uh, in, in, have you ever felt like Absolutely. an imposter? I feel like one right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say that you know, a little tongue in cheek. Imposter in so far as when you, you've picked up that my career has been a little bit all over the place. I've gone from retail into banking, into food and beverage now, consulting. Um, the first time I've walked into any one of those industries, I've felt like an imposter because I've very quickly been given a lot of responsibility that I don't think that I've earned, which is a very different mindset, once again, to my male counterparts who have that I can do anything mentality. But you know, I've always given myself a very short window to allow me to wallow in that space because it is quite self-destructive. So yes. Actually, I'm here for a reason, and the fact that you trusted me with this job must mean you see something that I may not see yet, but I'm willing to explore that. So continuously, you seem to have challenged your own assumptions and those of the others by taking certain conscious steps towards sure. 
making sure that you're reaching where you want to reach and yeah. focused. Uh, what are, according to you, what are some of the uh, ways in which one can effectively engage with the workplace? I think authenticity is going to be your strongest asset. Um, if you can walk into the workplace and be true to yourself, I think you've won half the battle. People can pick out fakeness quite quickly. Um, I've also found just being honest about what I know has been helpful as well. So I'm not afraid to say I do not know what you're talking about or you've asked me to do something, what does that mean? Whereas a lot of people try to save face, it's been quite clear for me. It's more about making an impact on the people that, I'm, that I work with. And I will always say that work with rather than that, that work for me because I think that's a completely different dialogue once you, you, you embark on it. I think over and above that, if I can inspire someone to dream big, to you know, aspire to be bigger and better, then I've done good and I'm, I've done my bit for, mm -hmm. for, for the economy, for the world, for another human being, however you want to phrase it. How important is mentoring to the whole process of growing in your career? I've worked once again with very, very powerful men and women, and mo mostly men. A lot of my female counterparts tend to gravitate towards other women, which I find it's, it's, it's almost counterintuitive. If you're working in a male-dominated environment, the men are the ones making decisions. You almost need to understand how they think, how they work in order to be effective in their world. So for me, my mentors were mainly male. And how do you go about developing mentors? You need to understand what you want to start with. So your mentor is, is, is created almost to fit your needs rather than the other way around. You've got people whose egos mean that when they're speaking with their colleagues, yes, I mentor 15,000 children from you know, all over the world. For them, it is part of their CV, whereas you are depending on these people to guide you through your career, to guide you through your decision making, which makes it quite a criti it's critical that you've got a good match. Um, I think knowing what that person represents, knowing their value system, knowing their ethical base is all really important for that pairing exercise. You don't just pick anyone. One of my strategies, for instance, would be in a new environment. I observe my, I, I, I observe my colleagues. I observe the powerhouses in that space. I start to identify characteristics that perhaps I lack. So for me, it's what do I not know how to do well and who can teach me to bridge that gap? Fantastic. So, so you, it's, it's very interesting what you're saying because you are saying that at one level, I have to be constantly self-aware and you know, engage in a, in a process of looking within an inside out approach mm -hmm. and then identify people within my own career or outside of it who can potentially build those competencies, emotional or intellectual that I might not have, but is necessary for the kind of position that I'm aspiring for. Now, if we were to draw on this, would you say that somewhere the gender debate has been rather unidimensional because uh, from what you were saying, it appears to me that while you had your communal attributes of, you know, of, of being a woman. You said that you celebrate being a woman, but at the same time, you also have those competencies which are traditionally considered male. So, do you feel that we are doing disservice to this entire gender debate by looking at it as a spectrum of males are here and females are here? It appears from what you are saying that somewhere in order to be successful in your career or at least, you know, navigate your career successfully, you might have to develop competencies which are so much more multidimensional and that might apply to both men and women. Absolutely. Well, there has been a substantial increase uh, in women uh, having moved towards tertiary education as compared to men, but at the same time that has not translated to women getting employed at the entry level and even if they do, there is you know, some kind of a leakage that happens and lesser and lesser women reach the top. So somewhere I think the gender debate is also necessary. Why do you think there is this pipeline effect? Oh. So anecdotally, I would say because women face completely different sets of circumstances. Parenting is one of them. The impact of parenting is going to be very different for females than it is for males. Um, I'm a mother of two, and my career took a break at the point that I decided to, to, to venture into parenthood. My partner, on the other hand, was able to carry on soaring. I think a personal challenge I would face is being out of the workplace for the year that I took off on maternity leave, for instance, meant that going back, I'm almost starting to prove myself all over again. So on the one hand, for people who choose to go down the family route, that is a real, it takes out a good five years from your career. 
some women might choose to stay at home longer because it's a really important part of their existence and they want to be there to support their children and to be around for their formative years. But if you've missed out eight years of your career doing that, one, your CV has almost become irrelevant. You are now competing with people, you know, younger, the younger generation that's either just come out of uh, the schooling system. So it becomes a very highly contested space for what you thought you were able to do. Or industry has just moved on dramatically since you were last in it. So that is the, probably what I would consider the top um, factor. I think over and above that, a bit like we're talking about being a fraud, very often women wait to be validated by external forces. If it doesn't come, and often in these high-tiered roles, you're not going to get it from anybody. You almost need to push your way through. If you don't have the boldness or the strength to do that, you're going to settle for that middle tier management, which I think is quite tragic once again. Mm -hmm. Now, let's move a little bit into your entrepreneurial career. Um, what are the optimal conditions, you think, that, that enables someone to transition from that corporate career to being self-employed? Chaos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, by that I mean there's a stability that you get spoiled with working in a corporate role. You know exactly when in the month your salary is going to hit your account. You know exactly what you're expected to do month in, month out, more often than not. At the point that you break from that, you're suddenly faced with uncertainty around one, whether you've taken the right decision, mm -hmm. if you've got enough money to sustain you as you go through this process. There's, you know, I, I've often joked about how at the point I became an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, I became everything from the janitor to the CEO because I didn't have a tech department to call and say, oh, my website needs updating. I had to figure out how it's all done. So a lot of things you take for granted by working in the corporate world get dispelled immediately and you really do need to be ready to get your hands dirty and to be able to navigate that uncertainty effectively. What, what advice would you give? to people who would like to move into an entrepreneurial career? I'll start off by saying understanding what you can do mm -hmm. is a starting point. At the point that I decided to leave my role or to give up in, in um, my banking career, I spent months on end harassing my friends and asking them what I could do, what am I good at? And it sounds really elementary, but there is this soul searching process that you go through where you really are haranguing people to maybe inspire you to understand what you need to do. The market is flooded with people with all manner of ideas. What makes your idea different? What makes your idea viable commercially? If you're filling a gap, you want to be able to, 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 to very quickly identify the processes that you're going to need to you know, take in order to fill that gap. So there are many inputs that go into this process, but the biggest one is around chaos, as I, as I phrase it, because it is not certain. You think you've figured it out and then something happens that completely changes your course mm -hmm. or you're let down by people. I also would say having the right support network around mm -hmm. you is optimum. So be it your partner, your friends, family, that support does a lot to mentally get you to the space that you need to be. Um, I would say savings take a lot of stress off you as well. You don't, the last thing you want to do is to worry about finance when you decide to become an entrepreneur because that's what kind of gets you running back into the corporate doors if you're not careful. And just perseverance really. Yes. And that again, I think that, and consistently, there is, there is a theme that is coming up that at the end of the day you're saying that the responsibility for making change in one's life essentially lies with you and you alone and you have to then make sure that you know you create the right networks you choose the right mentors you identify what is it that you're good at you have enough self-awareness so that you develop your competencies sure. and steadfastly just move towards absolutely. where you want to be absolutely and there's nothing like pressure to really kind of motivate you to get things done at least for my personality type the more pressurized i feel the more results i'm likely to, to, to give <laughs> one last question as to what is your conceptualization of leadership? What does leadership mean to you? Uh, I conceptualize leadership as really just being able to make a positive impact in whatever environment you're in. I may not be leading people, I might be leading resources, but I've got to be able to do that well.
awareness is also a big one. So being aware of your environment, you know, building good, solid relationships with the people that you lead. I think it's important to be able to just legitimately claim that spot because people can see what value you add. Mm -hmm. And how do you continue to develop your competencies? Reading and researching, talking to people, understanding your market. You know, I, I can't emphasize enough the power of knowledge, especially when you start playing in the bigger, the higher echelons of the corporate um, triangle. Um, so really, for you to be accepted as an equal, you need to know what you're talking about. It's one thing to get in there because someone's believing it's another thing to prove that there's a reason that they thought you could do the job well. And I would want to be surrounded by people who equally have the same ethos. I think it's absolutely critical the team that you work with. You don't want divisive elements in there. You don't want to have your hard work sabotaged because somebody can't be bothered to either sign up to your vision or has got a contradictory standpoint. When you enter a new environment, not everybody's going to stay with you. I think it's not being afraid to let go of the bad fruit. Um, that's not to say you walk in and you fire people because you know that loyalty goes a long way and the knowledge that comes with the legacy um, staff base. But really just embracing what you do and enjoying it.